ITU is a UN specialized agency for ICTs, and we're also the organizers of AI for Good in partnership with 38 UN sister agencies and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance sustainable development goals and scale the solutions for global impacts. We are pleased today to discuss AI and climate, destination Earth and AI. We encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A box and say hello in the chat. You can find these at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our moderators today, both from the University of Oxford, Philip Stier, Professor of Atmospheric Physics and Head of Atmospheric Oceanic and Planetary Physics, and Duncan watson Paris, Atmospheric Physicist and Postdoctoral Research Associate. Over to you, Philip and Duncan. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. So it's a real pleasure to continue this series with a talk on Destination Earth and AI or talks on Destination Earth and AI. And uh, to introduce our two speakers, so it's Peter Bauer and uh, Peter Duden, uh, both from ESMWF. I realize not everyone is from the climate and weather community, so ESMWF is a bit of a tongue twister, so I should introduce it. It's the European Center uh, for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, and it's sort of the leading weather forecast center in the world, but also increasingly moving a bit towards climate. Um, just to start off with Peter Bauer. So Peter is the leading expert in weather and climate modeling. He's led both uh, the satellite and the, the modeling sections at ESMWF. He obtained a PhD from the University of Hamburg. Actually, as I just found out in my research with the same supervisor as mine own, Hartmut Grassl. Um, he did uh, then a stint at UCA and NOAA in the United States, followed by a visit at NASA Goddard and a number of other visiting appointments. Uh, then he joined ESMWF and rose through the ranks to his current position. But in particular of relevance for today, he was also a coordinator of the EU flagship proposal, Extreme Earth, that then ultimately led to the digital twin Earth program, Destination Earth, that's at the center of today's session. Then I'd like to also introduce Peter Duben, who is coordinating the machine learning and AI activities at ESMWF. Peter did his PhD also in Hamburg at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology. He then did a postdoc with Tim Palmer in our department in, in Oxford, and then he joined ESMWF uh, as a scientist, but now holds also a Royal Society University research fellowship, uh, research fellowship there, and is now, as I said, coordinating the machine learning activities. But without further delays, I'll hand over to Peter, Peter Bauer in this case, who will kick off our, our discussions. Thanks very much, Philip. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present our efforts here. Uh, I think it's a very good time. Uh, we know that climate change and extremes are in our faces. We see the consequences of, of man-made changes to the climate uh, almost on a daily basis uh, worldwide. Uh, and with a recent uh, nomination of uh, and, and successful um, uh, um, uh, prize giving to uh, um, Klaus Hasselmann, also from Hamburg, uh, and Manabe um, uh, of the Nobel Prize for Physics. I think it shows that there's a political and scientific weight right now in this discussion that justifies actions like this. So Peter uh, Dubin and I will give a presentation on Destination Earth. Uh, Peter Dubin will spend the second half of this presentation on the uh, AI and machine learning particular uh, uh, aspects uh, of the program, while I will introduce Destination Earth and the digital twins that we believe are the core of the developments in support of Destination Earth. Um, Philip has already introduced what uh, ECMWF is, so we can move to the next slide. Um, uh, digital twins are really at the heart of Destination Earth, as I just said, and what this is, is really uh, about a digital replica of the Earth system, uh, just shown, uh, like shown on the left uh, hand side there, that where on the left hand side you have an observation and on the right hand side a simulation of the same thing that allows you to understand and explain change and based on that formulate actions to make sure that our society is able to deal with climate change adaptation, for example, and with risk management uh, in the context of extremes. So digital twins are an interactive framework that allow us to do that. And I will explain a bit more what that is. Next slide, please. Uh, but first, Destination Earth. Uh, Destination Earth is an actual program uh, that the European Commission intends to 
start and launch in, in November. So that's only a few weeks away. Um, the three partners in that will be uh, ECNWF, so ourselves, the European Space Agency, ESA, and the European Agency for the Exploitation of Meteorological Data, uh, UMITSAT. And these three agencies will co-develop uh, Destination Earth and be in charge of, of uh, bringing our abilities to deal with these uh, climate change effects and extremes in a more uh, in, in a better way to support policy making and the implementation of, of such policies in the EU context. And uh, Destination Earth was announced in the, by the European Commission in the context of the European Green Deal. I'm going to come to that in a minute, but connected to that because it's uh, supported by uh, the department in the EU uh, uh, that manages uh, digital technology. It is related to the European strategy for data and European, European strategy for digital future. So supercomputing, big data, and obviously machine learning are big parts of that. Next slide. So as I said, uh, Destination Earth will be handled by three different entities. Uh, they have different responsibilities. Uh, European Space Agency will be in charge of what's called the core service platform, which is basically the portal that gives access to everything that Destination Earth will produce, so all the data that it will produce in addition to existing data and complementing existing data. But it will also deliver a platform that allows users to interactively play with the data and even workflows and, and simulations uh, as they are being developed uh, underneath. Jumitsat will be in charge of what's called a data lake, which is a virtual repository of data that can sit in existing uh, repositories, but also is fed by what Destination Earth will create in addition. Uh, and a lot of contributions of such data will be produced by the so-called digital twins. Uh, this is the responsibility of, of ECMWF, and they will focus in the first phase, so the first two and a half years of Destination Earth, on extremes. So these are weather and geophysical uh, extremes and climate change adaptation. Uh, some key figures uh, about the program. Uh, so as I said, uh, Destination Earth is funded by a technology uh, directorate uh, under the European Commission, uh, which is called uh, DG Connect. Uh, and that program is, is new, it's called Digital Europe. Uh, it will have, have roughly a funding of seven and a half billion over a seven year time frame, And the clock is ticking, so 2021 counts already. Uh, we expect additional uh, financial support to arise from the so-called Horizon Europe program that most of you are probably familiar with. The activity is uh, supposed to be kicked off in November, uh, the first phase. So the phase we're dealing with right now is two and a half years long and will last from November this year to like April, 2024. But then we'll, we'll then be followed by other phases that extend the capabilities that we have founded in phase one and will widen the scope of the activities beyond extremes and climate change as well. So the budget for phase one is about 150 million, uh, which is shared between the agencies, as you can see here. Uh, most of this money will actually be procured. So ECNWF, ESA and UMITSAT will write invitations to tender and then consortia can form just like for Horizon Europe and then bid for, uh, for the projects and the money. And I'll just refer you to the, the webpage uh, down there for further information. Next slide, please. It's probably needless to say, but it's always helpful to put some of this in numbers uh, because we're, we're talking 150 million here for, for Destination Earth. We're talking you know, more money for Horizon Europe in, in support of research. But there's always the question, you know, given these investments, what is actually the business case for, for doing what we're trying to do? So create a better uh, information basis in support of decision-making, for example, and of course, research is part of that. Digital infrastructures are part of that. You know, but what are we actually trying to address here? Apart from environmental change, is also cost and value. Uh, and uh, some of these uh, estimates that have been made by several agencies just highlight, you know, how much value and, and cost we're actually talking about here. Um, and the publications are, are shown here, for example, by the World Bank, just in the U.S. Uh, you know, the annual cost of uh, reaching or, or fulfilling this is the, the aim uh, of sustainable development goals, uh, you know, builds up to uh, several hundred billion uh, every year and is going to 
uh, become more expensive than that after. The European Green Deal, which you probably have uh, read about, uh, estimates an investment of about a trillion altogether uh, in the next uh, 20 or 30 years to reach net carbon, uh, net zero carbon emission in Europe. And there's there's other figures, you know, that put this in, in context to what we think was already a very expensive uh, COVID effect on our society in terms of cost. Next slide, please. You know, it, you can do something similar for extremes, and there's 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 comparable publications issued by United Nations uh, or by, uh, by 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 countries like the U.S., for example. And uh, you have, for example, by the United Nations, uh, a publication that's uh, revised like every year or so, that uh, puts together uh, the economic loss, but also the number of casualties um, uh, that result from extremes, and the numbers are staggering. You know, and if you put this slide and the previous slide together and all the other publications that exist in that context, you, you come up with numbers that, you know, justify any kind of investment in research in digital infrastructures to help mitigate these effects. Next slide, please. Um, Destination Earth, I explained, uh, digital twins is something that you may have seen creeping up in publications uh, a lot more. The origins are, of course, not in our domain. This originates uh, from, from industry. So industry is using digital twins to design and manage and optimize production processes that can be a factory, but can also be something larger like entire wind farms or, or you know, you know, bigger industrial entities. And it's all about observing a system in real time. So collecting all the observations that are necessary to, to do that having a digital replica of that production process uh, in the computer and to perform an on the fly optimization and supervision of that process to make sure that it runs optimally, that resources are invested optimally, and that if something happens or breaks, uh, that can be potentially predicted and, and mitigating actions can be taken. And that kind of generic concept is increasingly, increasingly something that is uh, transposed into other areas, uh, including ours. And how that works, uh, we will show on the next slide. So in our system, you would say the system that we're trying to replicate in the computer as digital twin, twin is Earth. And that would basically mean everything that matters to us. So on the right-hand side, you know, expressed in terms of, of impacts, it would be anything related to or affects our society in terms of health, energy, food, water, or, or you know, uh, risks associated to extremes and uh, natural hazards. And what it takes to do that is on the left-hand side. At the top, uh, in terms of science uh, and in terms of methods, uh, a lot of which we have decades worth of experience uh, developing, but which has to be brought together in, in a more concise and a more efficient framework uh, through digital twins. And the bottom left is more the idea of what technologies it takes to do that. So, so, so top is methods and science, bottom is the actual technologies. And it's probably clear that it takes the, the co-design and co-development and co-evolution of the two together to achieve the best possible outcome. And that relates from uh, across HPC, big data, internet of things, you know, smart sensors deployed in fields, wind farms, mobile phones, even all things, all things like that. And AI and machine learning plays a particular role here because it, it really cuts across everything. Because you could think of machine learning uh, being relevant for acceleration in HPC as much as surrogate models in, in Earth system science, for example. And Peter's gonna explain you a lot more about that. So left and right have, have to come together. The benefits, benefits needs, need to be reaped uh, on the right, but what it needs is an investment on the left-hand side to achieve it. Next slide, please. So a, a lot of people who read about digital twin, twin think uh, it's, it's just like a, another earth system model or something run slightly better, but it's really, the, the, there's really, really three reasons why it's different from a simple earth system model. And we've described it in a, in a couple of, uh, of uh, publications, uh, for example, here one at the top left. It's of course, better models, so better simulation models, which require a better understanding of, of what's going on out there and which will help us understand cost-cause-effect relationships. But it's also the better combination of simulations and observations. I mentioned before in this industrial digital twin example that it takes simulations and observations at the same time to optimize uh, the understanding and the control of the process. 
but that then it needs the full integration of policy sectors. So this is what was on the right-hand side of the previous slide. So anything that's, that matters to society in terms of energy, food, water, health, needs to be fully integrated. So we immediately understand if we progress in terms of earth system science, what does it mean in terms of, you know, uh, uh, food yield uh, in, 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 a year, in years to come, or how do we optimize irrigation to optimize uh, uh, the effective use of water resources, for example. And then, of course, everything needs to be accessed and configured in a flexible framework so that we can play with it in the context of a, of a water user or an energy user or policymaker. So it needs to be interactive. And that, as I said, requires the full range of digital technologies and certainly what's shown here in the bottom right, AI is everywhere. Next slide. So reason number one, more realistic models. Um, it, we, the, just now the IPCC is, is publishing the, uh, the AR6 report. So the most recent assessment of climate change as established by the leading uh, prediction and projection centers in the world. And if you just look at one result, which I show here, you see that there's a lot to do actually towards more realistic models. So what these figures show is a, is a categorized like world map of effects uh, and, their, and our understanding and the agreement of these simulation systems about what's actually going on. Uh, the top left graph relates to temperature, the bottom left to precipitation and the top right to droughts. Uh, the colors indicate where these systems agree on the sign with that of the change, you know, and red indicates heating. And I think we have quite good confidence and the, the modeling and observation systems agree that it's actually warming up. I think that's, that's something we're very certain about. And the dots in these boxes and these um, hexagons indicate the agreement and the understanding and the confidence we have in that actually that heating is related to anthropogenic uh, contributions. And you can see the heating signal is clear and the confidence in that it's man-made is, is high as well. As you go away from, from the, the pure thermodynamics into uh, hydrological processes and even dynamical process, that confidence is actually reducing. And you can see already that uh, for, for precipitation, for example, the coverage of, of green and the number of dots in the hexagons is reducing. So we have much less confidence in the signal in terms of water cycle. And if you go to the top right, what that means in terms of droughts, for example, so some things that's very, very relevant to water and food management, our confidence is, is decreasing even further. And that is simply justified by or, or the reason uh, because our models are not good enough. And the reasons for that are manifold. And right now there are several activities uh, in our community to, to improve on that state. Next slide, please. And there's currently three different schools about how to do that. One is, uh, and that's these three different arrows here. One is, and I, and I cited like three different papers you can look up uh, where you know, these three different schools are kind of, kind of promoted. And, and the result is probably you know, a, a mixture, a combination of the three just to, to steal that thunder straight away. So the top one is investing in resolution and saying, you know, the more, the better I resolve my system, the more understanding of the detailed physical processes I, I have, and the better I understand scale interactions. So how small scales affect large, large scales and what it actually means in terms of, of change. So that's that precipitation kind of thing. Uh, the middle one is really more like uh, more of the, the previous uh, school of what we did in the past, make sure that the complex the models are complex enough uh, to represent everything and rely on approximations of the details. And the bottom one is really something that's probably very much long uh, up the alley of, 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 of AI and machine learning that says, you know, a lot can be spent in terms of computing and, and science in, 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 in these models up there. But a lot of processes are either unknown and maybe, uh, or, or uh, it's simply uncomputable. And maybe we have to invest more in machine learning methods to kind of uh, complement uh, everything that we can do otherwise. And of course, there are other concerns about that. But as I said before, the, the, the truth is probably, or the, you know, the, the, the outcome will probably be a mixture of the three. Next. Um, reason number two was this integration of policy sectors. And that is really a deviation from uh, past ways of how science information is turned into information of societal relevance. And that's like what's shown on the, the, on the flow diagram on the left-hand side, 
what's what's presently done is that scientists produce through CMIP or other other ways uh, scientific data. The data is being picked up by users and then translated into information relevant for society. But what's on the right hand side is probably more important uh, that this flow is of, of information and, and design of such systems is actually inverted. And that such systems are much more designed with what the application actually is in mind than today. And that you know these, these drivers and the hard requirements that finance in this case or insurance, but water, food and health obviously have in terms of information provision, uncertainty, quantification, these kind of things. And, and possible actions they can take following scenarios actually designs what the client, what the scientific uh, design should should be in terms of modeling or or operational prediction systems. So it's really an upside down of the of the flow of information. But that's really important, and that's something we need to build into our digital twins. Next, please. And what that means is that we always have to think through entire chains of information and data to understand what on the left hand side for example it means in terms of science so the link for example between a heat wave and a drought and what that means for example with relevance to mortality social instability or or crisis in economies worldwide and there's different value chains uh, along these different areas but uh, just to make sure that we in fully integrate in our digital twins always that these value chains exist and that we represent them as much as we can, the digital twins to start with. Next slide, please. It certainly takes different ways of computing. And I mentioned as my reason number three, uh, the interactive platform and all that. Parts of that interactive platform and the enabling digital technologies uh, is certainly computing. And that requires scaling up our computing capabilities. Uh, we talk a lot about exascale, so 10 to the power 18, a floating point operations per seconds. This takes very, very large systems. Our present systems, you know, models, for example, or data simulation systems are actually not able to run on such large systems at all. And that's because our software infrastructures aren't ready. We have ideas for how to change it, uh, which is kind of shown in a schematic way on the bottom right here. Um, but we need to make sure that that is actually fully implemented in our digital twin and operates 24 seven and reliably as we expect so apart from you know, connecting science and upgrading our model understanding, apart from integrating the policy sectors, we also have to make sure that we can actually use the full range of digital technologies uh, as is required and to make sure we, we use the investments in infrastructures appropriate, appropriately. Next slide. Um, and that is probably also leading to a different way of how we how we manage such, such resources. Uh, the, the, classic, the classical traditional way of, of these kind of things is yeah, you take a big problem that you use a computer for, you run it on a, on a big machine that, that you buy and put somewhere. In the future, this will increasingly be run across federated infrastructures, which means federated HPC systems sitting in different countries. That implies a, a data handling uh, framework that you know transfers data between these 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 places uh, very quickly and then layers and layers of software on top of that that allow actually to extract the information and modify the workflows that operate on these hpc systems in a flexible and configurable way and this step hasn't been made yet and that's another very important ingredient of the digital twins to make that happen next slide please uh, increasingly, this concept of digital twins uh, and everything I said before finds traction in our community that is not straightforward. It has not been straightforward. But if you look at some of these publications here, certainly uh, the recent uh, publication by the Royal Society uh, that's embedded in like 12 white papers uh, preparing for COP, uh, they mention things like this. You know, they, they mention this intimate link of, uh, of modeling, simulation, data, digital technology. They talk about digital twins and, and this entire concept I have been presenting. So increasingly you find that that entire logic uh, of this presentation is actually uh, accepted in the community and is becoming a reality in Destination Earth, for example. Next slide, please. Um, and it builds on past investments. And I, I mentioned initially, you know, that, that what we've seen uh, this year in terms of the, uh, the Nobel Prize awards to Hasselmann at Manabe, what they have done in terms of you know uh, using physics-based models to simulate what's going on 
trying to uh, differentiate natural variability from anthropogenic uh, contributions and think about you know how this responds to scenarios this entire logic of, of thinking has not been created by us has been created by them has been awarded with a with a uh, with a with a prize and we're trying to bring it uh, to the extreme extremes level or exascale level if, if you wish uh, so it's really building on past investments and trying to scale them to the extreme next please uh, and that's my last slide. So in the end, uh, we're trying to continue what's been done in the past, but really accelerate it and propel it to an entirely different dimension. And that is embedded in this holistic digital twin approach that needs to address science and the uptake requirements uh, at the same time. It delivers on both information quality. This is what relates to better models and all that, but also this information extraction and the flexible workflows, open access to data and tools and all that. So this is all part of the digital twin concept. It always has to be co-designed together. And it still requires significant investment. So digital, digital twins and destination Earth is only the start. Uh, it's a lot of money. It's certainly well spent, but certainly not enough to, to, to deliver the whole program. And it needs more than that. It still needs big machines, and it still needs a grander organizational concept that Destination Earth can, can provide. But at least Destination Earth is the first step and the catalyst for this. And with this, I hand over to Peter. Yes, so no, um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit, I'm also going to talk about Destination Earth, but a little bit less about the digital twin, but a little bit more about AI and machine learning in particular. And I'm going to start about um, to talk about AI and why we actually kind of are so interested in machine learning right now towards the Destination Earth project and the digital twins. So the reason why we're looking a lot into machine learning right now is, um, first of all, the increase in data volume. So on the on the right side here, you see a figure of the um, the different, um, uh, of the developments that we had at the data center at EastWF and the compute center. So you have um, on the x-axis the time scale over the last couple of decades. And on the y-axis, you see the performance that we had at the specific supercomputers that we were using over time in here. And the orange line in this plot is basically the, the increase of the compute power over time. And it's linear because it's a logarithmic plot, and it's exp ex which indicates an exponential increase. And that's basically more slow. But at the same time, there's also the blue line in this plot, which is also linear. Um, and this is the increase of our data center, which is also has also grown exponentially. And uh, basically, we need to make use of this data. And machine learning provides one way to actually extract better and more useful information from the data. Second of all, um, there has been an enormous amount of progress in hardware developments towards machine learning in the last couple of years. So the slide on the left I've stolen from Thorsten Heffler, where he tried to basically collect all the different companies who, are make, who, have, who have, ma have developed machine learning hardware dedicated for, um, who are hardware dedicated for machine learning in the last couple of years. And this um, well, market is still growing. There's still more companies coming up here. And basically, this is a multi-trillion dollar industry and um, the, the next generation of supercomputers is really going to be optimized for machine learning applications in principle. So there's a lot of compute power now available for, for these methods. Um, the third one is that there's also a lot of software. Um, so it's very easy for domain scientists, for example, to write a fairly complex machine learning tool with a couple of hundred lines of um, Python code, but just using one of the libraries that I'm, I'm mentioning here. So it's actually, um, there's a, a lot, um, it's, it's quite easy for people to get started if, to some extent, and um, a, a lot of progress is, is happening as well in the software development. And then finally, there has been quite a, an amazing increase in knowledge about machine learning. So we're talking about something like 100 papers published every day on artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. And this means that we nowadays are much better to develop customized solutions for our problems than we have been, let's say, 10 years ago. What does this actually mean for weather and climate predictions? Um, so what I've brought here is a figure of the workflow that we have if you want to make weather and climate predictions. So you basically collect observations, and uh, then you do data simulation where you bring together the observations with the model world to generate initial conditions. Then you um, perform your numerical weather forecast with a model to look into the future. And then finally, you have the post-processing and dissemination step where you basically take the output of the model and post-process it and provide um, make products that you can then disseminate to the users. And underlying there is this high performance computing and big data processing infrastructure, which is required for all the different components of this workflow. And what I've done is I've asked around at ESNWF um, who is actually working on, on machine learning applications right now. And I have three categories. Um, there are boxes that are planned, there are boxes that are ongoing, and there are boxes that are published. And if I now show you all the different application areas, 
each of those as a box, you should be overwhelmed and that's okay. I'm not going to go into detail with all the different applications, but what you should see is that there's nowadays machine learning applications all over the place. At least people are investigating those machine learning applications. And some of them are still planned, some of them are ongoing, but some of them already are in a stage now where they have published papers on this. So it's kind of getting more mature every year. Um, and also those application areas are really distributed across the entire workflow. So there are some dealing with observations or post-processing or HPC or whatnot. There are also challenges if you want to work with machine learning um, in the destination Earth type framework. Um, so first of all, um, you have a lot of domain scientists and you have machine learning scientists who have to work together one way or the other, but they often share a fairly different philosophy. So domain scientists like think, to think about physics and physical reasoning. Machine learning scientists like to think about data science problem with input, output, loss function. And often it's difficult to communicate between the two and also to build trust in the different solutions that the two communities come up with. So it's very important to actually combine the two communities and to work together. Second of all, it's also true that um, the domain scientists and the machine learning scientists often work with different tools. So um, for the model development, we most often work with Fortran and CPUs, whereas the machine learning scientists will most often work with Python and GPUs. So we also kind of have to bridge this gap in, 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 the, in the, the ways we work with the different tools. Then also off the shelf machine learning tools will often not be very useful for our physical applications that we have in uh, system modeling. Um, so it's not that we can always um, just use tools um, where you can identify cats and pictures and just transfer them easily to our physical applications. We also still need to learn how to scale up our applications. So I told you that there is a lot of high performance computing power available, but we still are only at the beginning to actually be able to tap into this resource. So we're still learning how to scale up our applications. Often, if you develop machine learning tools, it's kind of difficult still to integrate them back into the framework of the conventional modeling. Um, so back into op your operational models, for example, in particular for things like numerical weather predictions and stuff like this. So um, it's, we also need to learn how to combine um, existing conventional tools with new machine learning tools. And then finally, um, sometimes machine learning tools are kind of, we, 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 we we hesitate to trust them a lot, in particular because they're very bad at what we call extrapolation. So if you, for example, build um, a machine learning tool for today's climate, and then you um, use it in a, in a climate model to look into the future 100 years, and they will, you will have weather situations that have never been happened before, um, we, we often cannot really trust us with, um, the machine learning tools to actually respond correctly to this new situation because they can't do what we call extrapolation. So there's also a lot of research that we need to do to kind of build more trust in those methods. How do we tackle those challenges? Um, so first of all, um, there, as I told you, we have a lot of applications all over the workflow with a lot of people involved, and we need to get go organized. And for at DCWF, we have published what we call the machine learning roadmap, um, which is basically trying to kind of build a roadmap for the next five to 10 years and specific milestones on where we want to be at a certain point in time in terms of the infrastructure that we want to develop in terms of software and hardware, but also in terms of training um, getting the communities between machine learning and domain scientists together and so on and so forth. So we try to get organized as a community. <clears throat> we also need to kind of learn from the best and those who actually know better um, how to build the perfect machine learning solutions. And for example, from an RBF perspective, again, we, we try to, to partner up with companies like Atos and NVIDIA, in this case, for example, with a machine learning project of what we call the Center of Excellence for Weather and Climate Modeling. So we try to kind of get involved with the, with the, with the machine learning community and really learn um, how to use machine learning at scale and also like the cutting edge of the machine learning sciences um, in our domain. Then we have to also learn how to build customized um, well tools for our specific problems. So um, there are a couple of problems um, that, that are specific to our domain. And one of them is, for example, that we have a very scale interactive problem at hand. So, we typically try to simulate the Earth system in weather and climate predictions. And here you have a system like the atmosphere, for example, that is stretching out over a large number of um, orders of magnitudes in space, so on the x-axis here, and a large number of orders of magnitudes in time as well. Um, and you have basically features that are on the scale of the, the, of the whole globe, like ENSO and seasonal um, cycles, but you also have features that go um, further and further down the scaling um, all the way to the micro scale. And if you want to build a perfect weather and climate model, you will probably have to represent all of those. Um, if you want to build a good weather and climate model, you will probably need to represent um, most of those interactions somehow within your model. So the question is, can we actually use machine learning to represent those scale interactions? And um, there are tools that actually indicate that this is possible. For example, 
there are tools that are called encoding decoding networks. So what's happening here is that you have a neural network and you have an inputs that is kind of high dimensional. So for example, high resolution. And then you basically go to um, further hidden layers and you reduce numbers of degrees of freedoms in those layers. And then you basically end up with a code that has a much smaller number of degrees of freedoms than the input or actually also the output because towards the end, you actually also decrease the number of degrees of freedoms again. And you can also cross cuts between here. So you can actually make connections between the input and the output at high fidelity, at high quality. So you, you are not necessarily losing information. And a structure like this could potentially be used to also represent scale interactions in the atmosphere, for example. And this is possible. So a lot of groups are looking into those encoding, decoding structures for atmospheric sciences. I just want to give one example where we try to do um, what would be called downscaling. So you have an atmospheric fields at 50 kilometer resolution and you try to downscale those fields to precipitation fields at 10 kilometer resolution to be able to actually improve your predictions for precipitations given the, the coarse resolution model state. And what we do here is we're doing exactly this encoding decoding. So in this case in time, and what you have here is a network structure and how it's working. And on the x-axis, you have the time dimension in this case. So you're getting information in at six hourly resolution and then you coarse grain this to hourly to, to, um, to, to daily information basically and then you cross grain again to weekly information and then in the end you kind of go back to daily and then you output the precipitation results as you want to do it and it, it turns out that using this encoding decoding in time actually helps you to bridge the scales and actually to extract information in the time series very efficiently and not only this um, we also combined this with a tool which comes from natural language processing which is called self-attention mechanism so what's this is it's a specific tool that is basically bringing words in a sentence into context. And it, it turned out that this is also very useful to actually still improve our results um, on top of this encoding decoding structure. So we have to learn how to kind of use those very specific machine learning tools that are developed for different purposes actually within the within climate domain and within our modeling. And for example, in this case, to represent multi-scale features. We also need to learn how to make use of machine learning at scale. So how can we actually use those excess scale supercomputers that Peter mentioned, for example, um, to really build useful tools with, with machine learning. And there we're still at the very beginning, but we're kind of getting there. And one way to do this is um, engaging in a, in a larger community again. Um, and we have here the so-called milestone project where we perform what we call a co-design cycle. So you actually, we are building applications um, for machine learning and weather and climate. And then we, we, we kind of build as well software tools uh, to make them usable efficiently on supercomputers. And then finally, we're also developing hardware designs that are really customized to our needs for machine learning and weather and climate. And we learn from this to then improve our applications again. So we, we basically try to kind of really get fit for, for um, using the, the hardware that is available nowadays efficiently in our, super, um, in our machine learning applications. Then also, um, we need to learn how to combine existing models and machine learning. And that's often more difficult than you may think. <clears throat> and one of the problems that you often have is that the observations are living in one world and the machine and the, the, the modeling world is basically not really correlated a, a, a lot to the observations because it's not representing the exact weather situations in, 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 uh, that you have in place, in particular for climate model simulations. Um, but during a process we call data simulation, where you bring the model and the observations together, you actually have both of them together um, in a, in a uh, well, representing exactly the same weather. And therefore, you can also try to kind of run the model forward and then compare the model to the observations that you have. And then you can diagnose the model error based on the difference between the observation and the model. And that's very interesting because it basically allows you to, um, to learn the model error by the comparison between the model and the observations. And um, this can be then be used once you understood the model error, you can actually put it back into the model and correct for the error within your predictions. Or you can also try to understand where the error is coming from, for example, by looking into the features that are important in this mapping. And we've done this in a collaboration with, um, with NVIDIA where we looked into the, the error predictions. So what we have here is now we, we take the three-dimensional state of the atmosphere and temperature as inputs. And then we basically, the, the deep neural network would basically spit out then the the result, well, the estimate for the model error that we get from our machine learning solution. And on the left, you have basically the target that we get. So it's a, the, the error pattern that we're training for. And on the right, you have the neural network prediction. And you see that the patterns are fairly similar. And also the patterns are physical. So we can uh, um, see that there is a sudden stratospheric warming happening, for example, right there. So it seems to be quite a good way to actually predict the error. But now the big question is, if you want to use this in our latest model cycle, for example, so the latest operational version of our model, we need to also upgrade this from, from the, the training data set that can spend over 10 years, for example, 
to the latest model cycle. And the model, latest model cycle is actually going to have a different error. So now on the bottom left here, you have an error pattern, which is not exactly the same as it was before because the model has changed and therefore the model error has changed. And we're now trying to actually also train a neural network that can represent this error down here um, based on a very short period of time because you don't have so much training for, for this upgraded model version. And you will see that the error is kind of looking a bit different from the, uh, at the bottom when you compared to the top, but it's actually still have a lot of features from the top one. So we still need to learn how to actually update those machine learning tools and when we want to use them in operational models, because then we also need to operate those tools with the new cycle. And this is actually may maybe more tricky than um, than you may think in the first place, but well, there's signs on it. And so, so I'm, I'm, I'm confident that we will make a lot of progress in the next couple of years. Another thing is that we need to build tools that make it really easy for the domain scientists to get started. And one of those examples is what we call the Climate Lab tool that we're developing also at ISNABLIF with Florian Pinot and Bora Raoul. Um, so what's happening here is it's basically a library <coughs> that allows you to read in data into the Python world, and in, in particular, a system um, model data or observation. And what's typically happening is if you have the, the normal machine learning workflow, this data processing is quite cumbersome. So you need to perform a lot of steps to actually um, read in the data and then handle the data and put it into cache and make it efficient, make the loading efficient and so on and so forth. And then you only after doing this, you actually will be able to um, build your machine learning tool within there. And then um, afterwards, you also will to spend some effort to kind of post-possess the, the results and to um, make plots, diagnose features and stuff like this. And the hope is that with Climate Lab, you will be able to make this data loading much, much simpler. So you will reduce the, the, what we call the boilerplate code significantly. And then the, the scientists will really be able to focus on the important part, which is the machine learning code, um, which is actually what they're interested in. And also Climate Lab should help, for example, with the post-processing. So we should try to make it simple for domain scientists to really get started with the machine learning tools available and um, kind of to provide the software infrastructure that they need. So that was kind of more about machine learning in general for Earth system modeling um, or Earth system sciences. Let's talk about what we want to do in Destination Earth and how machine learning could really help here. So you have the digital twin again on the right side um, because we just like this plot. Um, but how could machine learning help um, to improve uh, the, the digital twins in principle? The first point is that they are likely to be able to speed up the digital twins. So for example, you can emulate model components, make them faster, because um, if you kind of represent the same model component with a neural network, it's very likely that they're going to be faster than the co um, original conventional scheme. Once you have ported those, those parts of the models to deep learning, um, they're also going to be very portable because deep learning networks are very, very portable to whatever hardware you want to because um, tools like TensorFlow will actually take care of this for you. Um, the, the networks also typically are able to use reduced numerical position, which can additionally speed up simulations. Um, but next to the emulation, you can also think about things like um, to improve results, for example, for the dynamical core by looking into preconditioning of linear solvers or similar ways to actually um, improve the efficiency of the dynamical core. And you can also think about the bigger picture where you have the high performance computing system, for example, and you also optimize the workflow within the HPC system or the data loading. And finally, machine learning has also some, some potential to kind of improve data compression of the output fields that we will get. Second, we there's also some potential that we can actually able to be able to improve the, the twins as such. So for example, in the emulation step, you could not only represent the state of the art as a default scheme, but you could also try to represent schemes that are more expensive that you typically cannot use because they're too expensive. And I'm going to show you uh, um, one example in a minute. Then you can also try to correct for the biases, for example, um, like the data simulation example that I showed you on the, on the, the last slide. You can also do things like quality control of observations and observation operators, which should also help you to, um, to improve your data simulation process. You can um, do a lot in the quantification of uncertainties as well. For example, if you have ensembles, you can post-process them, or you can also um, kind of bring the model world into as closer contact to the observations and compare them. And finally, you should also be able to do things like feature detection, where you will be able to detect specific um, things like, for example, a tropical cyclone or weather front within your model simulation. And then thirdly, you can also build new tools and enable new science that, that may not have been possible before. For example, it should be fairly easy to combine impact models within the simulations if they are based on machine learning. <clears throat> 
You can also think about the information fusion more, so to kind of bring observations and, and the models closer together. Again, the quantification of uncertainty there. So you can, um, in, in terms of observation um, processing and operating, you can think about AI power visualization tools. Um, you can think about unsupervised learning and causal inference, basically trying to get extract more useful information from the, the large amount of output that you will get and so on and so forth. And then finally, also um, regarding the uptake of the data by the community, there are probably a lot of avenues how machine learning could make a difference. If you, for example, think about health applications that you have some, some sort of health data set, which may be local or in a different specific country, um, and you want to relate this to weather data, it, you, you often don't really have a, a nice physical equation that would actually describe this relationship. So there, machine learning can potentially help. You can think about energy, for example, the downscaling of weather information to the local wind farms or and so, solar panels, and to kind of really have more more dedicated um, predictions for the specific um, well the, the specific energy production farm at the, um, on a very small scale level. You can think about transport, where you can combine weather data, for example, with Internet of Things data. Think about just the the, the the data that Google would have available, for example, in terms of tra traffic, and you could directly relate this to weather. Think about pollution, um, where machine learning could, for example, help to estimate sources of, of um, pollution or to actually detect sources of pollution in particular. Or think about, for example, extremes where machine learning can help to, for example, identify wildfires within the models or pr predict wildfires within the model simulations. So there's a lot of things that can potentially be done. And what I'm going to do in the next slides is I'm going to show you one example um, for the use of machine learning for each of those four different areas. I'm going to start with the speed up of the twins, <clears throat> and in particular, the emulation. So what we do here is we run our model forwards, and then we store for a specific component that is expensive, we store the input and output pairs. And then we use this to train a neural network, and the neural network is then used to emulate the scheme in, um, that we had in the first place. So it's basically, um, we're training neural network to replace something in the model which is expensive. Um, why would you do this? Because typically, the neural network can be assumed to be very much more efficient than in comparison to um, to co the conventional parts. And um, also, this is a very active area of research. So I'm pretty sure that you, you may have seen the, um, the talk by Prenowitz and Pretherton also in the same series where they talked about their emulation study as part of the, the Wacom initiative. But we also have done similar study um, at Eastern WF where we looked into the, um, the non-orographic gravity wave track or um, parameterization scheme. It's quite a mouthful. So it's also like one of the parameterization schemes. And we try to emulate this with neural networks. And we actually found um, that we get quite good results. So we actually are able to, um, to kind of emulate the scheme, but also we can adjust the quality of the scheme by increasing the decrease of freedoms or decreasing the decrease of freedoms of the network. So the more complex the machine learning tool, the better the results. And we can basically adjust um, performance and um, quality if you want to, what, to the sweet spot. We also we get similar costs if we run the machine learning tool within IFS, our forecast model at the moment, which is a bit disappointing. But if you think about GPUs, so the next generation of supercomputers, we get something like a um, factor of 10 increase in the efficiency. So that's good. And we also can use this emulator to generate what we call tangent linear in a joint code, which is code that we are specifically working with in our 4 var data simulation part. So it's also useful for other components to be able to kind of represent those parameterization schemes in a simple way with the neural network. And then finally, we're actually able to decrease our forecast error because the reference truth that we trained against was very um, was had a higher fidelity than the, than the default version that we have in our model. So we're actually not decreasing our quality, but increasing. That was a, the, the, the highlight for the speed up of the twins. The next one is a highlight um, to improve the twins. And here we also do emulation, but now we actually emulate a scheme which is called Spartacus. And Spartacus is a radiation scheme which is taking care of the three-dimensional shape of clouds. And that's very nice, but it's too expensive for use in our normal operational models. So in our normal operational models, we use a tool which is called triple clouds, which is assuming that the clouds are flat in, 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 within a grid column so that they don't really have the shape of the sphere, for example. Um, we would like to work with Spartacus, but we can't afford it. And now the question is whether we can actually emulate the difference between triple cloud and Spartacus just using neural networks. And it turns out this is kind of quite possible. So this is a study performed by David Meyer at Reading University. And what you see in, this, in the figures here is a cross-section through the atmosphere from South Pole to North Pole. And you see the results for the difference between Spartacus and triple clouds um, for the long wave heating rate from the top and the short wave heating, heating rate on the bottom. And on the left, there's a truth. And on the right, there's a neural network prediction. 
And there are differences, no question, but basically the, the basic physics the neural network gets right. And also um, the neural network is basically coming in for free. So if you take Spartacus, which is four times more than four times more expensive than our normal um, triple cloud solver, which is your normalized to one and the cost, um, the neural network is basically just less than a percent of the cost of the triple cloud solver. So this, the, the plots on the right basically come for free, whereas the plots on the left are too expensive for to be useful. And therefore, we can potentially actually improve our models by representing these physical effects of three-dimensional shapes of clouds using machine learning. Um, the, the other thing is to build new tools and enable new science. And here I want to show you, you one example which is focusing specifically on uncertainty quantification. So what we have here, it's actually a study performed together with a group of Tim Palmer in Oxford, so in Philips Deer's department. Um, and what we have here is we have um, the IFS simulation on the top. So that's our operational forecast at Eastern WF. And you have different weather situations in the different columns here. And um, on the second row, you have a Nimrod observation, which is um, coming at one kilometer spatial resolution, whereas the model simulation, the IFS simulation is at 10 kilometer resolution. So you basically map from coarse to fine grid here. And then you um, perform this mapping using so-called so generative adversarial networks. And you have three different realization of these GUN networks in the column three, four, and five. And what you should see is now um, that it is a difficult task to go from very coarse resolution to much finer resolution here. And the, the precipitation fields don't, are not perfect, no question, but they look like precipitation fields in the first place. And they're also fairly different between them. So it's not that they are extremely similar between the three different realizations of the gun. So the gun is actually managing to kind of derive an ensemble of predictions, if you want, just based on this one mapping procedure. And this ensemble can be also used to kind of estimate uncertainties quite, quite well. So we actually can, can get quite good ensemble scores by using these guns. And the last one, the uptake um, of the data by the community. <clears throat> so if you think, for example, this is an example by, um, by Jerome Barré from the Copernicus section, um, where he's basically looking into the effect um, that the lockdown from COVID had on the emission of NO2. And what he's doing is he's basically comparing um, the NO2, um, for, uh, the NO2 um, results that we get from our normal the state of business as usual forecast model of pollution in, as part of COMS and is and comparing those those model simulations to the satellites that actually measured um, the pollution at, this, at the time um, during the lockdown. And what you see, and the, the, the question is like how much of the difference is now coming from the typical naive weather um, as, as well from, the, from, the, from the lockdown impact and, and how much of the difference is actually coming from just a, a different weather situation from one year to the next. And using machine learning, he's basically looking at the individual stations using grading booster, booster regression techniques, and he's able to kind of isolate the, the real weather adjusted um, impact of the COVID lockdown uh, on NO2 um, on a, a NO2 emissions in comparison to what the reference is, which is basically just the the, the naive interpretation of the model and measurements. So it's it's a good way to actually isolate the signal. And you will see that there's a significant difference between left and right, which means that, the, that it was a good idea to actually kind of use machine learning here. So that's the last slide. So I'm almost done. Um, I just wanted to have basically an outline of what, what the, the world with Destination Earth could look like in the future. I'm not saying that everything like this is going to be realized, but just imagine there would be a, um, a Destination Earth um, collection of data from both like observational data sets, but also model data sets that would be available at the hands of the researchers in, in a very good way. And um, then also imagine that the Destination Earth would kind of provide a 4D state of the Earth system at a kind of unprecedented level of detail and resolution, and also with a good level of data availability. So the, the scientists really have, um, and also basically, in fact, use cases in industry, for example, have really the data at their hands when they need them. And then also the, imagine that Destination Earth was providing mapping tools from one from any point in time and space to any point in, in, in time and space using machine learning in particular. So you will also be much better to relate the different data sets to each other. And then imagine that you would also have interpretation tools and you can basically look into this mapping and understand what the physical meaning behind this mapping actually is and extract like physical information from this as well. And also understand a little bit more about the causality between the different um, features within the different data sets. And then also imagine that Destination Earth can provide you tools to estimate the uncertainties of all the data sets. Um, and again, this can be based on machine learning and the, and the different uh, mapping between different data sets, for example, or also uncertainty estimates like I've shown you before, 
um, and and basically with the use of, for example, ensemble data um, output in principle, but then also on top of this, make machine learning post processing. And then also imagine that Destination Earth will provide a framework to run AI-based user models within the digital twin. So you can basically um, hope for running your own machine learning model within within the digital twin as it is generating the data. So kind of much closer to the operational um, pipeline. And then also imagine that Destination Earth will provide machine learning power to fly through visualization tools and all sorts of nice things to kind of visualize the data and to really look at the, the core of the data. And all of this, these tools should basically be scalable, scalable and easy to use from Python and Jupyter and Julia, whatever framework you really want to work with. And as I said, I can't promise you that everything like this is going to be there, but it would be, um, but, but maybe Destination Earth can, can realize some of those parts. Don't forget to register to our ESA Eastern WF machine learning workshop that is going to happen in the mid of November and it's already open for registration. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. And I think both Peter and I are happy to take your questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Peter and Peter. Um, there's a huge amount to cover and lots of, lots of interesting um, aspects to, to digest. Uh, I'll dive straight into the questions because there's, there's uh, already been been a few, which is fantastic. Um, Peter Bauer kindly answered a couple in line. Um, I, I think you, you marked this question from Michael Spicer, uh, though, Peter, that you'd like to, to answer live. So which of the three schools, and that presumably refers to these areas of, uh, of the digital twin earths, do you feel has the largest improvement potential? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough call, and it's, it's better to... <laughs> To, to say this verbally than, than write anything down on it, you know. So, so this is not about a religious war here, you know, where we say, you know, it, it must be one or two or three and we put all our money on, on, on the winning horse and, you know, hope uh, will we'll come in first. In the end, as I said, it's, it's probably a mixture of the three. The question is, what do you do? What do you do to kind of uh, push uh, the three, and, and you know, and, and what do you would expect you you gain from that? Number one is certainly necessary because that, that was the resolution invest in uh, invest in, uh, because you know resolution we will benefit from resolution. That's very clear because because we will resolve processes that we presently only approximate because we don't resolve it. You know, so there is, it is clear that there's benefit. There may not be immediate benefit because our models hide a lot of errors because we make assumptions on what happens at the circuit scale. And so once we increase resolution, you know, these come up and, and we can see this already in, in, in experiments today. Yeah. But ultimately resolution will be key. The importance there is that a resolution is a, is a safe horse, but it needs a serious investment because any, any you know, resolution translates into, into cubic computing costs. So if you double your resolution, your computing effort uh, you know, grows by a factor of eight. So that comes with a serious implication that we have to cover at Destination Earth and other programs are trying to do that. So number two, which is like the, the more of the existing kind of, kind of complex models um, uh, exchange all bits at the, at the same time. This will happen anyway. There's a very large established community that, that is out there uh, that will work anyway, because that is a lot about, you know, comparing different models with, with the same approach, doing similar things, defining into comparison protocols and this, and look at, at where we can be. I don't doubt that this will happen, but the question is, can you reach breakthrough with this in the short time we have? And the last one with, with machine learning, this will happen anyway as well, actually, I believe, because there's so much money in machine learning, so much interest, and Peter has given you many examples. Uh, this will happen anyway. The important here, important factor here is that um, it, this needs to be done in close communication and collaboration between Earth system scientists who understand the substance, and then the computational science and hardware providers to make sure this problem is not being dealt with in the black box kind of sense, but it's done with the scientific knowledge and, and expertise that we have in that, uh, in that domain so that it's, it's directed in the right direction. So, so we don't do stupid things and, and use very powerful computers to kind of create cause effect relationships that don't exist, that violate budgets, that violate first uh, you know, scientific principles and all that. So it, it's really not a religious war. It's really about, you know, placing the investments where they where they uh, are most effective in all three of them. And I imagine a lot of the difficulty will be in 
bridging all three of those aspects, right? In, in terms of utilizing that increased resolution for ML and coupling the, the land models at, at these high resolutions. Um, I, I think that the next piece, question, sorry, uh, would probably be uh, perhaps Peter Duman can, can talk about, because you, you talked a lot about different applications of ML. Um, and so uh, Martina asks, what about the computational cost of training AI and ML and how well can these methods reproduce extremes, um, rare events, and, and how might that work for climate change? Yeah, these are very good questions. I'm, I'm afraid they're also very general. Um, so I'm not sure whether I can give you a very satisfying answer because my answer is also going to be very general. But um, I mean, about the compute cost, uh, yes, there is cost involved, no question, but there's also con cost involved for conventional tools. I mean, Peter is talking about them running those digital twins and exascale machines, right? I mean, it's not that they are coming for free. And for the machine learning tools, often it's actually quite beneficial that the cost is um, during the development of the tool, but then if you use them in operations, for example, they're typically fairly cheap. Um, so this is kind of quite beneficial for weather and climate, but it doesn't, I mean, there, there is going to be machine learning, well, um, machine learning is going to generate cost, no question. I mean, yes, it's a research going on on, on a high performance computer. Um, how can AI reproduce extremes? Yes, that's a bit of a, um, that's, it's, a, it's a, a matter of concern to some extent because we, we, our tools cannot extrapolate. And this means if you have, for example, a specific application um, where you want to, to, to predict a one in a hundred years event um, in terms of, with your machine learning tool, but you only have a time series of 40 years, then you're kind of getting into trouble a little bit. Um, for some applications. However, that's not quite true for all applications. Um, so for example, if you, you're using a tool all over the globe, you're also averaging over a lot of different scenarios, for example. So then it's much more likely that you will actually be kind of closer to the extreme as well in specific cases. And also um, the there are um, kind of developments as well that help you to, to represent the extremes. For example, you can learn for distributions rather than for specific um, situations, um, uh, for, for, for distributions rather than specific regression techniques, for example, in precipitation and predictions. Um, there also, there's been a, a very nice paper by, by Google published, I think uh, one or two weeks ago, where they're using generative networks, for example, to generate also like a lot of distributions of the, of the cases. So you could generate ensembles again. And this helps you also for the prediction of extremes because often it's not just the deterministic prediction, but it's really the uncertainty that's going to be key. And then machine learning can actually help you with extremes and so on and so forth. But it's a very large topic. I don't think I can really answer this question specifically. Um, then the next one, how to train AI for rare events. It's kind of the same thing, right? I mean, you, you can only learn what's in the data. So at one point you will get into trouble. Um, yeah. But in principle, it's the same problem again. Um, and there are methods to do this. And we have, we are, we are just three years into the research for really useful machine learning tools for weather and climate. And in three years from now, we may have good solutions for those problems as well. And then how would it work in a changing climate? Yeah, that was actually one of the points that I mentioned as well in the challenges, no question. I mean, um, often if you just emulate, for example, you can train from climate models. So you have a reference to, to train against if you want, um, if you just want to speed up simulations. But yeah, it's a matter of concern and we need to learn how to build reliable tools um, that, that can extrapolate more. However, if you, for example, learn how to combine physics with machine learning, that's, that's what Peter suggested in his response earlier, then you can also be, um, be more, uh, you can also trust your machine learning tool better because you basically can imprint physical knowledge into it as well and hope for the can hope for the right physical response, but it's active area of research. There's no silver bullet here. It's uh, yeah, ongoing work. Peter, uh, you, you touched on this implicitly already, uh, so you can probably respond briefly, but there were two questions about the related carbon footprint of, of all these uh, methods. Maybe you want to link this a little bit. Which Basically, what, what is the carbon footprint uh, as a result of such a massive AI project? I mean, people know GPUs get quite warm. Well, well Peter, you talked about exascale, so I, I, I'm, I think you should talk about this one. <laughs> so I, I guess um, you, could, you could just sit back and say, look, it's, it's for a good cause, so carbon footprint is fine, but that's too simple. Um, I think the important message is future big computing systems should rely entirely on, on renewable energy resources and be placed in countries where cooling is not an issue. Right now, that's not the case. That's only uh, the case for individual systems like, uh, you know, in European terms, EuroHPC in Finland, for example. 
but the future and, and uh, certainly systems that support significant digital twin simulations should sit in those countries. Um, but carbon footprint is also related to ongoing existing efforts, and that relates a bit to uh, another question uh, I've seen. You know, how, you know, model existing model comparison programs and such. You know. So, so one argument for accelerating developments with di digital twins and destination Earth and such like is uh, is the argument that you say, you know, I'm, I'm running at present model intercomparison projects with hundreds of different models, um, many of which are not very good, many of which are derivatives from one another, and so don't really pr produce independent information on future climate states from one another. So the question is, you know, do I rather invest in one or two or three or four or five of the best models and really push them to the extreme scale as a good investment of uh, of carbon you know spent on computing or do i promote uh, as now hundreds of models many of which probably don't produce a lot of information you know so that's that's a bit of a disruptive way a move away from 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 existing practices and i think the carbon footprint argument actually promotes uh, the former, you know, rather fewer, better, push to the extreme. Um, you touched on some of the existing uh, uh, MIPS, for, for want of the jargon, but, you know, these, these large model intercomparisons such as CMIP6, which obviously recently mm -hmm. was um, completed. There, there's a question from uh, Trevor Smith that you, you, you marked you might like to answer live, and he was asking to what degree these kind of newer models and approaches are coordinating with these existing efforts. Um, so, so, so I think as a, as a program, Destination Earth needs to connect to them. Uh, and that's what we do anyway. As I said, you know, part of what we do is, is run through procurements and there's a partnership effort in Destination Earth that is, is made or designed for Destination Earth to find its place in the existing ecosystem of such programs. You know, there's also Copernicus. Copernicus has has existing services uh, on uh, extremes, for example, on climate, on atmospheric monitoring, on marine, you know, all the, there's, there's a lot of activities, there's national efforts as well that are being substantially funded actually in parts. So Destination Earth needs to find its place uh, and, and, and kind of sit in that uh, or coexist in that ecosystem. Uh, and that's part of, of phase one of what we're working on. It's certainly not, uh, uh, it will certainly not replace MIPS because it's not a model intercomparison project. Uh, but it will certainly link to to any efforts that that is worth integrating with. Um, one important point to mention here is also that uh, a similar con con concept like destination Earth, at least you know the backbone of it, you know the the notion of digital twins, the integration of um, of impact sectors, the excess scale message, and all that, you know, is already part of a of a new activity under the World Climate Research Program, and it's called the Lighthouse activity. There's a number of lighthouse activities, four or five, that are being launched right now. And one of them is on digital earth, you know, and the contents of that is by no surprise, not too far off uh, uh, from what I've explained under under destination earth. So you, you can see there's there's buy-in in, in the in, into the idea. And of course, there's a recognition of existing programs and destination earth, that destination earth needs to find its place uh, amid those. Fantastic. Uh, I just have one one sneaky question, if I can can get it in last. Um, I just wonder what what opportunities there are for industry to buy into these these large projects, and and you know the, you talked a lot about the infrastructure and presumably quite large um, hardware and um, yeah other investments. Are are there big partnerships involved? Um, or opportunities for these partnerships with some of the there, there are there are certainly uh, opportunities actually within uh, destination earth we will probably write a procurement um, for like a, an, an, an industry right. institutional co-design of digital technologies for the future so kind of prescribing a framework that could be followed up by funding agencies and industry uh, how to collaborate in the future on key technologies. And it certainly takes both. It's not something we can write. We need industry support from that. But then uh, in terms of infrastructures, uh, there are efforts. Peter has mentioned the smaller sized uh, center of excellence between ATOS, NVIDIA and ourselves, uh, the center of excellence. Uh, 
there's other projects uh, also funded by the European Union where we have like co-development activities like this. Yeah. But what you would really like to see is that, you know, uh, big companies uh, that presently may, may invest in, in space flights, you know, uh, uh, rather invest uh, their money, uh, and it does take that kind of money, it takes less money actually, to be invested in, in key infrastructures that can actually support that breakthrough that we're asking for, yeah. you know, and that would be uh, private money, very well invested, creating an enormous response and recognition for that private investment, you know, this is what it's all about. But it would certainly be very well invested uh, and very well received by the community. And I'm sure there's a business model to be formulated around that as well. So it's not just a, a charity. Uh, it's, it's a true uh, investment for, for return in the end. But we would like to see some, something like this from the big companies. Please do. Fantastic. This is probably a good, good time to draw this to an end. It's been a really good session. But just to link up to what you said, one of the aims of this series is to bring together uh, players from academia, research and industry. So it's a really great pleasure. Just next week, we have Solomon Sefer, the IBM Vice President for Climate and Impact Science, and Hendrik Harman, IBM's Climate Chief Scientist speaking. So I hope you and all the other listeners join us again next week about this. But first of all, thanks again to Peter and Peter for two really outstanding talks. We had great discussions. And well, I hope I see you all next week again. And back to you, Ida. Thank you. You're still muted. Still muted. Yeah, we don't hear you. I don't, we unfortunately can't hear your sound. <laughs> but otherwise we can also go into the exit movie. Go ahead. How about now? Now we hear you. Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, my apologies. Okay, so I'll begin again, but you probably all know the spiel. Thank you very much, uh, Philip and Duncan and both Pauls for a really interesting session. And my apologies for the sound glitch. Uh, we are now opening a quick poll with one question. Please answer and let us know how much you like this session. And feel free to watch this session on our AI for Good YouTube channel. This session will be there along with every other session, pretty much, uh, and share with your friends and colleagues. So we also encourage you to check out our AI for Good program online on our website for more sessions that may be of interest to you, including the one that Philip just mentioned next week for AI and climate science. Um, but for this week, tomorrow, we have a session with ZTE on open source and accelerating AI innovation at 8 a.m. Geneva time and 2 p.m. Beijing time. We are pasting the links in the chat and encourage you to join. We would like to once again thank everyone involved, our panel, participants, partners, sponsors, and co-convener Switzerland, and we hope to see you again soon.
rewind selector. 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 